Hello, welcome to New Harvest Christian Fellowship, Manchester, England, and thank you for subscribing to our sermon podcast. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. We pray it will be a blessing to your life, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, we'll give you our contact information at the end of the recording. Thank you once again. Enjoy the preaching. Our text this morning is from the book of Ruth. Uh, We are not uh, revisiting uh, this book's story in entirety. We did cover uh, much of this book in March of this year. If you're interested in that, we had a series of messages in March. You can look on our podcast system uh, for that. It's available at many outlets there, and you can have a look at that. My desire this morning is to extract information from this text that will enlighten you to the the things of God for your particular life, hopefully enlighten you to some of your obstacles in your life to getting to where God wants you to be. And then I also have prayed that this would challenge you to uh, move towards God. I know all of you are holy and Christians and all of those kinds of words that we use But sometimes we can be in the house of God, be Christians, be born again, and not be as close to God as we should. And the reality is, is that we need a closer walk with him. My desire today is that this message would help you in that endeavor. So let's read the book of Ruth, chapter 1, 18 through 22. Uh, This is out of the King James Version of the Bible. It says, when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, she left speaking unto her. And so they, the, they too went uh, until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, is this Naomi? And she said unto them, call me not Ma- Naomi. Don't call me that. Call me Mara. For the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, I ask, Lord, that I would be able to speak clearly that I would be able to speak the words of life to your people. I pray you would give me clarity of mind in delivering, but I pray mostly for your people, that their hearts would be open to receive your word today that would bring them into a tighter, more fixed relationship with you. I pray for those who have grown dull of hearing, Lord God, that today they would have fresh ears, fresh receptacles of their hearts to receive the things that you're speaking today. Satan has no place here, so we will not even acknowledge him. We put our confidence in you, Lord God, today because we know that you are greater than any work of any feet of darkness. And we ask today for your blessing upon this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Gracie and I have recently applied to the home office to have our visas extended for another long period of time. I hope that makes you happy. Um, (laughs) I I, I reckon this, like we we believe in freedom here, so you can pray either way. I mean, you can pray for us to to be granted extension and we'll be your pastors for uh, as long as we can stay here. Or you can pray against us and say, man, send them back to America and we'll see who wins. And we'll say, in a a few weeks, I'll let you know. (laughs) With all joking aside, I have to tell you that even though we're uh, foreigners to Great Britain, Great Britain has for many years always felt like our home. It has always felt like the place that uh, we belong. But uh, funny enough, when you're applying for a visa, you feel very much like a foreigner. They call your name and you go in and I'm talking to this, we're, we're talking to this girl with a thick, thick Yorkshire accent, you know, and my accent sounds so harsh, and our R's are so R, and, uh, you know, the way we speak, and it made me feel very foreign, even though this country is our home. 
in today's text that we're reading here, we have the story of a uh, true story of foreigners and immigration. We have the story of people who moved from one place uh, to another. And I'd like to entitle today's message something that uh, is dear to my heart, and I'll just call it righteous relocation. Most Britons will not move any further than 100 miles from their home in a lifetime. That's just fact. And I would say that's probably true of most people anywhere in the world. But this does not mean that you and I do not understand the concept uh, of immigration or migration or relocation. So don't confuse what I'm talking about or trying to communicate here today. This is nothing to do with the controversial issue of immigration because uh, the UK and the US both have strong positions on this and, and it has caused a lot of turmoil and I'm not speaking of that at all. I'm not even talking about physically relocating from one place to another. What I am trying to communicate to you today is that many people, think about this, they get used to to being in one place, and then they move to another place, and then they become foreign to that place that they're now in. I want you to think about it like this. God is trying to move you from one place to another place, but you're going to feel like a foreigner when you move. Generally, when people migrate, they migrate for reasons that make their life better. Some of you are from other countries other than Britain, and you've primarily moved to Great Britain, England specifically, to be here, to be able to have a better life, and that is understandable. But the thing I want you to understand today is that sometimes better can be uncomfortable, the same thing is true for us spiritually. God is trying to move us into a better place, but that can be uncomfortable. It's not always easy. There's a struggle that's going on. I will even say it like this. There can be conflict uh, when you're moving from a, a place that you're at to the place God wants you to be. Because most people remain where they are, most people don't move, most people stay 100 miles from their home their entire life, most Christians stay right where they're at in the first two or three years of their salvation, and that's about it. I, I don't say that to offend you. I say that to enlighten you. I say that to, to, to teach you about what's really going on because, see, we lie to ourselves. We, say, we, we, we count the years, and we say, oh, well, this many years I've been saved. And we look at our initial testimony, which is grand and great and, and fantastic. And you move and you say, well, I'm good and I've, I've really grown. And the reality is, is you're still probably in that same spot because better is uncomfortable. And it's not easy to become better in the things of God. Most people stay confined to the culture of the comfortable. They stay confined to the culture of the comfortable. Whatever is comfortable, that's where they stay. Whatever feels good, whatever uh, uh, tickles their fancy, as we say, whatever makes you feel okay, that's where people remain. But I want to tell you that God wants you to immigrate. God wants you to move from where you are to where he wants you to be. Do you understand that? That's so important. And you say, well, I have moved or I have tried. I, I, I'm challenging you today on that. I'm challenging you. And I say that with love, with respect, with dignity. But I do challenge you because immigration, migration requires, first of all, it starts off with misery. We'll talk about that. And then it requires movement. And then metamorphosis. We need all three of these in our lives. So let's start off with this, that we often, we like the idea of transformation. Most of us like to hear those words, change, metamorphosis, transformation, transition, all those words are good. But the cost factor often holds us back. People often say, I, I've got a guy that I talk to close to where I live at. I see him regularly, and he says, hey, Tom, how you doing? We have a little chat. And, you know, he says, you know, I, I, I want to move to America one day. 
And I tried to, pr- to dissuade him from doing it because he doesn't know what he's facing over there. And uh, uh, really, you know, it looks good maybe on uh, Hollywood movies, but when you really have to live there, it's a whole ke- different kettle of fish. And the reality is, is he likes that idea, but then I say, so what have you done to prepare? Oh, not much. I thought about it. I checked out a couple of websites, you know, and I just said, oh, well, good. But in my mind, I thought it's going to take a lot more than a couple of websites to get you from where you are to where you want to be. And that's what holds many of us back sometimes. And that's why many, and, and I'll say this to a few of you, you've remained the same for so long. And I, I, again, not to hurt you. I can, God can move you. You can immigrate. But you're going to have to listen. And we're going to have to get beyond this, Okay. See, when I talk about the cost of transformation, I talk about things like vulnerability. I speak about things, doing things that are not in your wheelhouse. If you move from one country to another, from one place to another, you have to learn a whole new set of rules. Life is totally different. Oh, some things are the same. I remember when I first came to England in 1990. Two, January 1992, and the people in America uh, who had never, ever moved outside of the area of Los Angeles said, oh, it must be easy for you because they all speak English. I said, well, they speak English, but I can't understand a word they're saying, you know. <laughs> they said, well, it must be good to be around people of your own color because I'm white. I don't know if you figured that out, but I'm white, and all the people in my hometown are not white, you know. And so they say, oh, you must feel good. I said, but look at my white, their white, two different whites, man, you know. <laughs> not, not, not the same thing. And the reality is you have to learn a whole new set of, uh, of culture if you're going to change, if you're going to immigrate. This is true spiritually as a Christian. Before I was saved and uh, once I became a Christian, you know, I, I was terrified of social situations. I was not very good at social interaction at all. If you think I'm bad now, you should have seen me 30 years ago. And the reality was is it was very hard for me to be around people. I don't know why Gracie liked me because she's so, you know, just talking and feels great going places. And she'll just walk up to, hey, how you doing? And all these things. And man, to me, that's like puts fear in my heart. I would rather hang out with the lads and fight in the street than do that. So, but when I got saved, I was very comfortable with behind-the-scenes ministry. I could sit behind a desk like these ladies do every Sunday. That would be no problem. I could work upstairs. I could work outside. I could do whatever God wanted me to do as long as I didn't have to be up here. And that idea just terrified me. But I knew, stirring in my heart, God wanted me to be a leader. And I didn't feel like a leader. I didn't seem like a leader. I didn't want leadership. I thought leadership was... Uh, I won't tell you what I thought. I just, I just didn't want that. But I couldn't get away from it. And I realized that if I was going to be a leader, I was going to have to become social. I was going to have to learn how to interact. I was going to have to learn how to stand in front of people and be able to declare things and speak things or I could never lead. And the reality was is I had to move from where I was to where God wanted me to become. But it was really, really uncomfortable. It didn't feel like a good fit. I heard one man say it felt funny. It felt funny. Sometimes other people make you feel like an alien when you're trying to go from where you're at to where you need to be. Other people make you feel like that. It was, uh, I had been saved a, a while and uh, Pastor Richard, uh, uh, or I'd been saved a while in a church that was local to New Harvest Norwalk, which was my home church, uh, asked, they were having a father-son breakfast, and they had asked Pastor Richard if maybe he could send someone over to this father-son breakfast to be able to testify and give a word of encouragement. So he asked if I would go. I said, sure, I, I wanted to go, and I did. And I remember going into this church uh, hall. Uh, this church was about two miles uh, from the Norwalk Church. It's only two miles. It was in Norwalk. It was in the same city. But I remember going into it, and it was just like crazy different. The culture of the church was not like the culture of the church that I was from. They were much more conservative. They were much more, uh, I'll just say, not like us. 
And the reality was is that they wanted me to speak, though, like who I was and not be like them. But I remember being there. And they, you, you, you know, in New Harvest, Norwalk, at that time, if you were to get up and say, hey, I'm going to give a testimony, everybody shout you down. Yeah, hey, yeah, go for it. Even if you didn't say anything intelligent, they would still be happy you had enough guts to stand in front of people and speak. These guys, when I got up, even the young lads who were there went like this. And just waited for me to speak. I felt like a fish out of water. It was obvious from my clothes. It was obvious from my way of speaking that I was not from their culture. That I didn't know what they were all about. But in order for me to do God's will, I had to break out of what was uncomfortable to do what God wanted me to do. This is so true for you and your life. Stick with me here. Migration, moving, immigration, however you, you want to word it, is at best difficult. It's difficult. It's hard to move. It's hard to immigrate from one place to another. You have lots of things you've got to wrap up in the place that you were, in the place that you're going, and you had to, like, break off some ties where you're at in order to make new relations to where you are. See, and that's what happens to us spiritually. You've got to break off ties. You've got to stop doing certain things and start doing other things. Immigration is difficult. Our text is te speaking here of not ideal immigration. Naomi left Bethlehem originally because of a drought. She moved to Moab and had been there for 10 years. Been a long time. Probably wasn't a good move to begin with. But she had moved from Bethlehem to Moab in order for things to get better, in order for her life to improve. Uh, it didn't improve. Things began to change. How many know things change over the years? If you're still living in a few years back, you, things are different now, folks. The world is different. Life is different. God is doing different things. The gospel doesn't change. The word doesn't change. But the world in which this operates changes. God's methodology changes. Are you with me here today? So, so important. Here, Naomi had lost her sons, two sons. How many know that was devastating for her? Not only had she lost her sons, but now she had her daughter-in-laws who were with her. Now they're widows of her sons. Uh, and on top of that, she lost her own husband. Life had been difficult for her, and now she's ready to go back, ready to go back to where she came out of, and here she's going back seemingly in a worse condition in which she came. Naomi, if we just put it into common vernacular, modern language, she's in a bad place. She's in a bad place in her life. You know, when you're in a bad place, you react differently sometimes, you react differently. Sometimes you might not act like that if you were in a good place. That's why some, it's bad to judge people when they're in a bad place. It's not right to judge people when they're going through a bad time. That's why as a pastor, I give people lots of grace, sometimes too much grace, but I give them lots of grace. Hey, don't speak like that. Hey, don't act like that. They're going through it. Hang on. Some people are saying, man, why do you do that? Why do you? It's because sometimes people are not in a good way. That's where she was at. She was not in a good way. She needs to believe that things are going to get better. That's why she's making this move. That's why she's transitioning from where she's at to where she thinks she's going to be. But it's not always easier to believe for better when you are used to worse. This is what happens with people who have been the suffer, uh, on the suffering end of abuse. They want to believe that things are going to get better. They want to believe that the memories are going to go. They want to believe that their hearts will change. Uh, but when they get there, uh, it becomes difficult for them to believe. In the book of Ruth, our, our text here in verse 21, the Bible says uh, that out of her mouth, Naomi says, I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Do you hear the pain? Do you hear the agony in this transition? in which she's going, Naomi is empty. Being empty is not easily resolved. 
It's not just like you go and you fill up on a good meal and, oh, I'm no longer empty. That's not the empty she's talking about here. This kind of empty is the kind of empty when you've been around a bunch of takers and they don't give anything back. Parents, sometimes you're empty because your kids just want, want, want. Give me this, give me that, give me this. And that's the nature of kids, isn't it? There's nothing you can do. It's part of life. But yet, if you're not equipped for it, you're not ready for it, or you have other extenuating circumstances in your life, it can make you feel empty. See, empty is not the same as tired. It's not the same as tired. We all get tired, don't we? Some of you are perpetually tired. You need a whole new sermon, another sermon for that. But I'm talking about, you know, you get tired, you can take a little breather, you can, you, you can go home and have a, a good meal, you can, you know, on a day like today, you can head out to the park and just enjoy the weather, you know, it can, uh, it's amazing how it can recuperate you, you know, it's amazing how you can feel good, but when you're empty, it's not the same. And you need to recognize that. Being empty is miserable. Naomi was in a state of loss. It was a real state of loss. She lost her kids, lost her husband, and was losing her daughter-in-laws. This was a difficult place. She was at a place uh, where uh, uh, it was a real condition that where people often feel like they've been forgotten by God. You might feel like that today. And it's easy to begin to be a person when you're in that condition to settle, to settle. I'm not moving. God says, better's over there. I don't care. I'm empty. Doesn't matter. People say, well, man, you've been empty a long time. I know, and what of it? People have attitudes when they're empty. People have mindsets when they're empty. And just because you have a a preacher coming in doesn't mean that he's going to break that mindset in you. You're in control. Whether you view yourself as full or empty, I don't have time to extrapolate the text here for you, but when she says, I came in full, that's not exactly accurate either. Neither was her complete emptiness an exact representation of her life, but that's how people feel. Sometimes when this time of transitioning, moving and migrating, it becomes difficult, and we see this here, with her daughter-in-law. Here we see Naomi going to the border, getting ready to cross over into her better, and her daughter-in-law comes right up to the border of better and then begins to turn back. It's a common thing with many people. God brings them out of where they're at, brings them to the border of better, and then they make a turn to go back, just like Orpah did. It's what happens so, so Often, they get to the border of better, and then they turn back. And the reason that this happens is because better is different. It's different. The place where you're at and the place where God wants you to be are two totally different places. Geographically, they're probably exactly the same place. Relationally, it's probably the exact same place. Your church, your friends, your family, it's the same. But in here, it's a different place. And it's a different place, and it's difficult because it's not how you've been living. And many people are, as I've said already, I'll say it again, are not willing to suffer the discomfort of the better and make the effort to alter their lifestyle because it's not easy. It's hard. See, some sins, let me, let me say it like this, some sins have a payoff. Like if you lust, it has a payoff. If you have greed, it has a payoff. If you get angry, it even has a payoff. Some of you feel good after you've let out that anger and blurted it out. It has a payoff. Other sins don't have a payoff, like gossip. Gossip doesn't really have a payoff. But in all of these types of sins, whether it has a payoff or not, it becomes a place of safety because you're used to it. Why do some women stay in abusive situations with abusive men? Why do they take beatings? Why do they take that kind of abuse? Because it's good? Not at all. 
because it's what they're used to. And that's why sometimes they'll leave that guy and get another guy, and that guy's worse than the, than the first guy. Why does that happen? Because they're, they feel this sense of safety there. It's what they feel destined to. It's what they feel life is supposed to be like. Sometimes Christians are like that. Well, this is how it's going to be. Us four, no more. I don't like the idea of a big congregation. I don't like the idea of a growing church. I don't like the idea of me having to invest my life on a greater scale to achieve greater things. Uh, this is often uh, looked at negatively, and we end up coming up with all kinds of reasons why staying where we're at is better. And I'm here to declare to you, you can stay there. Most people do. Most people will. But if you want better, it's going to require something. See, back, just very quickly about that gossip thing that I mentioned. See, everyone knows it's better not to gossip. Everybody knows that. So you say, I'm not going to gossip. I'm not going to gossip. I'm not going to gossip. If some of you have been gossiping, don't get upset. I wrote this a long time ago. <laughs> so I'm not having you in mind. But if the shoe fits, <laughs> better not to gossip. Everyone agrees. But then when you start to stop, See, I'm not going to talk about them anymore. You start going through withdrawals. Oh, man. Yeah, I know it's better, but it doesn't feel better. It feels better when you're sharing a little tidbit. What does the Bible say? They're like tid little morsels that go down into the stomach, you know. Oh. And so it becomes very difficult for us. You can't really understand this. You can't really understand this idea that God is moving you from one place to another unless you're truly walking with God. Because if you're walking with God, you understand one thing about God, is that God is not a stagnant God. God is not the same type of God doing the same things that he did with you in 1979. It's not the same thing that he was doing uh, in 2005 or 2015. Uh, it's a new thing because our God, listen to this, is a moving God. He's a moving God. God is trying to get you from where you're at to where you need to be. And if you're going to walk with him, you're going to have to put on your walking shoes because God doesn't wear slippers. God doesn't wear slippers. God sometimes wears work boots, but he often wears trainers because he's trying to move and get you to move. The Bible, Genesis, opens up in verse number 2 with the Spirit of God hovering, moving uh, across the waters. Uh, it ends in the book of Revelation uh, with, Lord, come, move quickly. This is our God throughout the pages of the Word of God. God is a moving God. It's a walk of faith to be where you're at, to where God wants you to be. It's going to require so much effort from you. But that effort is not just out of sheer tenacity. It's because you believe. It's because you trust. It's because you hope. It's because you dream. And you want this to happen. Are you willing to move? See, if you're going to walk this walk of faith, you're going to have to walk in the new. And that means you're going to be scared. And that means it's going to be difficult. And you're going to have to even walk like Naomi did when you're empty. When you're empty. See, oftentimes we are waiting for us to get full. Pastor, let me just get, you know, until I'm ready, you know. You're going to be waiting a long time. You're not ever going to be fully ready. You've got to move. You need a mind that is moving in order to not stay where you're at. See, I want you to know this. You might not always know where God is taking you. But one thing you need to know is that it's not where you're at. It's somewhere else. He's moving you forward. He's moving you ahead. He's wanting you to advance. And please, there may be one-tenth of one percent of people that God is speaking to in terms of moving geographically, locationally, but you better be mature, you better be strong, you better be ready, you better be having the fill with the Holy Ghost and power, you better know that God has spoke to you like nothing before, before you make that kind of move, but the majority of us, 
is God is saying, I want to move you from where you're at now to a higher level of maturity, to a higher level of growth, a place where you can act and live and function to making a difference in the world in which you live. The time has come for a seismic shift. And I firmly believe that God is shifting in the world. We're seeing things today politically that some of us never thought we'd ever see. Some of the things socially and morally are, 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 are not just like, oh, well, even young people who did not grow up in the era that some of us older folks go, have grown up in are still saying, wow, things are different. Things are moving so fast. And they are. God is going to do some good things. You can't just say, oh, all this bad stuff, it's all bad. If it's all bad, God's got a plan for that. God's got a plan to resurrect and revive. Why would I leave a good place to come to this place? Because I believe this is a better place, personally. I believe that. Why would you leave where you're at to where you need to be? Because you've got to believe God wants me to stop being that person that's down in the mouth. I gotta stop being that person who's nitpicking. I gotta stop being that person who's dabbling in sin. I've gotta stop being that person that's always just complaining. I gotta stop being that person that's pouty and has an attitude. I've gotta stop being that person because God has better, even if it's uncomfortable for, for me. God is a moving God. Let me take you a little bit deeper. The book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Verses 1 through 3 says this, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith, faith, do you have that kind of faith? Faith isn't just saying, well, I believe. Faith is that kind of faith, verse number 1. That's what faith is according to the Bible. When the Bible gives a definition, we don't need to add to the definition. That's it. Do you have belief system within you? that is hoping for things, and even though you don't see it. I'm believing for better, even though it doesn't feel like better. I'm believing for growth, even if I don't feel like I'm growing. I'm believing for awesomeness, even if I'm still not trusting that it's awesome. I'm going to believe. And then he says, for by it, for by this faith, this kind of life, this kind of mindset, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, listen to this, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which were seen or are seen were not made out of things which do appear. The worlds were framed by the word of God. Framed by the word of God. Let me just start by saying frame talks about creation. Framed, God creates this by his word. When God speaks, things are created. It also gives us the idea of protection. So God creates and protects when he speaks. If God is saying move from here to here, he will create here and protect you here. Stick with me. Only done it one time today, folks. When we see this, the worlds were framed by the word of God, it's easy to jump back into the book of Genesis and say, well, he's talking about creation. And there is some truth to that because God did create the worlds by his word, didn't he? When God says, let there be light, there was light. When God said, do this, he did that. When God spoke this, these things happened. That is true. But the problem that we have with that is in the Greek words that are translated into English here. When we look at this word worlds, there's two Greek words that are used. There's one that, that means, co- that, that, that said cosmos. And this is the structured order. This is like the planets and the solitary, uh, solar, solitary, solar system, sorry. But the word that's used here is that Greek word eon, as you see there, which means period of time or an age. So this gives us a whole new twist on this passage here. It's saying that God is able to take the, present, the, the periods of time and he's able to frame that season by faith. That means whatever season you're in 
oh, things are going bad for me. Walk by faith and move from here to there. Whatever has gone on in your life that has been negative, which I know it happens, it's real life. Whatever things that you've suffered as a Christian, as an unbeliever that's filtered into your life, you're able to say, God, I believe and I trust. Speak. And he'll frame the word of God for us. See, the devil can't get you unless you let him. The devil can't get you. He has only limited access to you just like he did to Job. Just like he did to Job. Do you remember the devil comes up to God and says, hey, give me your man Job. And he says, look, you can't have Job. He says, no, I want Job. He says, okay, I'll give you Job, but you can only touch him in this limited fashion. You know why he did that? Because he couldn't count on Job. He knew Job doesn't need a, a bunch of things to praise me. He knew that Job was able to do some things uh, that other people can't do. He knew that Job, uh, when he was frustrated, would still serve him to the point where he said, Woman, I don't even care if you don't want to walk with God. I'm walking with God. Uh, Even if God kills me, I will walk with him. That's how you get. That's how you immigrate. That's how you migrate. That's how you move from where you're at to where you need to be by having this attitude and this mindset. That God is framing your world. The devil might be looking for you, but he's not going to find you in that seat that you were in because you've moved. He might be looking for you in the gossiper's tent. He might be looking for you, you know, in that lusting tent or that lying tent. There's a lot of them in the lying tent. (laughs) He's going to look for you, but because you said no. I'm letting God frame my world. I'm letting his word frame my world. I'm letting him transition me from where I'm at to where I need to be. The devil won't be able to find you. You've moved. Let me wrap this up with an important um, understanding that we need to get. See, it's bad to come into a new place with an old attitude. It really is. It's, it's, It's bad to come into a new place with an old attitude. Because if you do, you'll just make the new place like the old place. See, God is trying to get you to go from where you're at to where he wants you to be because God has a plan for each one of your life. You can complain about me. You can complain about the church. You can complain about your husband, your wife. You can complain about whoever you want. But the bottom line is, man, it's you. It's you and God. And, and, and you can get mad at me. Go ahead. And get mad at me. Post me on Facebook. Do whatever you like. Do whatever you like. But at the end of the day, once all that's said and done, once I'm dead and you're still alive, man, you're going to be stuck with you. And you're going to have to make some decisions of whether or not you're going to stay in that land in which you're at or whether you're going to immigrate. Because it's a sad thing to come into a new place with an old attitude. God allows do-overs. Trouble is some people just keep doing the same thing over and over. See, God does allow change and he has room to change. See, this is what happens so many times. People move uh, uh, from one place to another. I remember when I moved to uh, uh, Liverpool, 1992. It was 1992, and I got uh, 1992. I got on the phone with a guy that uh, was ordering something, and uh, he had an American accent. He goes, "Where are you from?" You know, with like Americans do with that. Arr. So, where are you from? And I said, "Oh, you know, Los Angeles." And he said, "Yeah, I'm from Colorado." Wife wanted to move back over here to meet her family, whatever that means. He was all upset. He hated being here. He goes, hey, why don't you come down and play softball with us? I said, nah, mate, I didn't come here to play softball. See, the reality is is that people just want to bring their same thing over. That's why you bring your culture. You bring your culture from one place to another. And, you know, that doesn't matter. If you like certain foods, you like certain music, you like certain ways, that, that doesn't matter. But what does matter is when you bring an old attitude from a way that God is trying to move you to. And I'm not talking about, again, physical immigration. I'm using that as an illustration. I'm talking about the fact that if you keep on doing the same things and you keep having that same attitude, you're a a, a negative person. You're going to bring that negativity into the new things that God is trying to do into you. And that's the bottom line. And some of you are going to have to stand up and start being men and women of God and believing and trusting and saying, no, I'm not doing that anymore. You're already known for that. You're known that you're this kind of person. You're known for that. People know you're going to do that because they know your personality because you've been like that forever. And God's saying, look at no. I've got such great things. It's better. But it's going to be uncomfortable. Transition. And I'm challenging you today with God's love and mercy and his word. Will you make 
a change over Naomi and Ruth had come into a new place. Had come into a new place. Naomi's name means pleasant. Other translators say it means my delight. Or one man said my joy. That was what her name meant. But when she gets into her new place, she says, don't call me that. They said, whoa, there's my joy. Wow, my joy has come. My delight has come. Pleasant has come. She says, I am pleasant. You got it wrong. She was bringing her old attitude into her new place. She says, call me Mara. I'm bitter. I've been through it. I've gone through it. I've been around a long time. I spent 10 years in Moab, man. You don't know where I've been. You haven't walked in my shoes. You know how people have been through things. They they have attitude. They say these kinds of things. She says, I went out full and have come back empty. I've gone through all these things. You know what happened with her? And this is a sad state of affairs. Is that the changes that happened in her life changed her. Changed her. We're all going to go through some bad, bad experiences. And I don't want to say that so negatively, but we all do. We're all going to suffer loss. You know, Gracie, her her, her dad died while we living in, in, in England, you know. My brother died while we were living in England. All these bad things can happen. Difficult things can happen. We had family disruptions on the mission field, moving from where we were to better. That can get in you. The question is, will you let it? Will you let your experiences get in you? Will you let the past way of your marriage get in you? Is it going to change you? from who God wants you to be, that doesn't give you a pass. Her attitude was, I've lost so much. She kept saying that to herself over and over again. I've gone through it. All of her words were negative. All of her words were about the past. All of her words were things that have gone on. All of her words were complaining about things that are happening and taking place. Uh, She told her daughter-in-law, I have nothing to offer you. Nothing can happen through me. This was a story that she was telling herself. The problem was is the story she was telling herself was killing herself. Some of you have been telling the same old story over and over. And now no one will listen to you anymore because they've heard the story over and over, so you're telling it to yourself. And this is a sad state of affairs, brothers and sisters. And I'm not just making this up. I'm not just like, well, uh, bringing out some uh, negative thing. This is in the word of God. Why does God give us these stories? So we can learn and change and move and immigrate. People tell themselves the same old story. Gracie has a phrase that she tells me in Spanish when I'm feeling sorry for myself. She says, la misma canción, the same song. Just singing that same song, Tom. I get angry when she speaks Spanish to me. <laughs> when I first met her, I didn't know Spanish. Now I know what she's saying, man. I can speak it myself, and I'm like, no. But she's right sometimes. It's la misma canción. The same old song. <sighs> Some people have done more damage to themselves than the devil could ever do. Some people have done more damage to the church that they claim to love than the devil could ever do. It's because of them. It's because of their attitude. It's because of their their mara, their bitterness. Oh, they won't call it bitter. Oh, I used to be bitter, but now I'm not bitter. Yeah, you're bitter. You sound the same as you did when you weren't bitter, except you're just saying you're not bitter. She makes a statement. What a statement to say. What an indictment on her where she's at. She says, the Lord has dealt treacherously with me. She's lucky she didn't get a lightning bolt from heaven on that one. Some of us are lucky we haven't gotten lightning bolts from heaven on some of the things we said in our closet or on the phone or in our text messages. We should be very careful. It was true. She had lost sons, one daughter-in-law, but she was cheating herself. Why are you cheating yourself? Why are you so content to live in that land that you've been in? Don't you want the land of milk and honey? Don't you want the newness and the freshness? I know it will be difficult, but once you get used to that culture, 
you're going to love it. You're going to say, man, I never want to go back. There's nothing in that former place for me. Some of you have immigrated from another land, and that other land has, you know, family there and things that you remember from your childhood, things that you're like, and there's wonderful things in that place. But when you say, well, do you want to go back? Ah, uh, no. No. <laughs> I'm quite happy here. I've learned how to be here. But you remember the first month that you got here, you were ready to get on a plane and go back. See, this is how it goes. See, the trouble is, is that we cling to our past more than we care to admit. And we do what one man said, is we begin to weigh ourselves like by putting one foot on the scale. And we say, that's our weight. It's like we take our past and we put it on the scale and say, that's who I am. It's not who you are. That's part of who you are. You need to put your past and your future, your destiny on the scale. That's who you are. And I promise you this, God will always outweigh your past. It's what he'll do when you're willing to leave that aside. See, the problem was, and this is the problem with many of us, is that what Naomi had in mind was not what God had in mind. What Naomi wanted for her life was not what God wanted for her life. And this is the problem with so many, is that the things that you think are what you want to do, and you, 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 you want to put God's label on them, and, 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 and I'm not anyone to say, because I don't know. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know for sure uh, that what you're doing is God or not God. Please don't ask me for that decision, because I can't make that decision. But I will tell you this from experience and from reading the Word and experience and working with people often, too many times to count. What we think is God's will is not God's will. What we think God wants for our lives or what we want for our life when we put God's stamp on it and God says, that's not what I wanted. It's not what I want. It's not that he's upset, not that he's going to hurt you, not that he's going to send you to hell. It's just not where you need to be. You're still in that same land. You haven't migrated to the new land. See, you can stand at the tomb of what was or you can pack your bags for what is to become. It's your choice. It's your choice. You can look at your marriage and say, yeah, well, this is what it is. I'm stuck. You can plant yourself at that tomb, that dead tomb of a, of a, of a struggling marriage. Or you can say, no, man, I'm moving to this new land that God has for my marriage. It's up to you. It's up to you. I have so much to say, but i got to stop. And I know that I haven't taken it down my usual path, which I like to do in preaching, take you from one place to another. But I hope that you're seeing this idea of righteous relocation, that there's misery involved, that it's difficult, difficulties involved. People will hold you to your past. When Ruth got to, to the new land, she was more of a woman of God than any Israelite. She was closer to anyone else. And what did they say? They called her Ruth the Moabitess. The Moabites. The Moabites were the enemies of God. Was Ruth the enemy of God? No, she wasn't. We're going to experience that sometimes. We're moving to where God wants us to be, and people are going to label us wrongly. And you're going to have to deal with that. I don't know where to end. I have to end. Let me just end with this. Make a choice to not let your pain eclipse your purpose. Make that choice. Make that choice. Move here to there even if it feels funny. Let's give the Lord a big hand clap today. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you've been blessed or challenged by today's preaching and you'd like to get in touch with us, the easiest way is via our website at www.newharvestuk.com. You can email us at info at newharvestuk.com or look us up on Facebook or Twitter. You can call us on 0161 278 6305 or you can even write to us at 194 Chapel Street, Salford, Manchester, M36BY. We'd also like to extend a warm welcome for you to join us at any of our services. However you might be feeling, and whatever you might have been told, know this. God loves you, and there's a place for you in his kingdom. God bless you, we're praying for you, and once again, thank you for listening.